Are you on a journey? Are you looking for real people who understand real needs, offering real help? Then join us for a genuine experience with a real God. Welcome to Journey Church. At Journey Church, we offer real-life help for real-life needs. Join us now for a time of amazing hope and practical help from the Bible. Join us at Journey Church. And guys, give these guys a big hand of appreciation. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn me up just a touch, please, sir, in the microphone. I'm <clears throat> quickly losing my voice. We have many services like that. I won't have a voice. Um, many of you know we just got back from Israel and we had a fantastic time while we were there met some really really wonderful people we had some, some miracles happen people falling and getting back up you know the opposite of I fell down I can't get up they got up um, but we saw some things that, that were they're jarring to me. They, they bring me back to the reality of the new covenant. When you go into a land that is so steeped with religious activity, that everything points to religion. Now, let me define religion because you might have, you might have warm, fuzzy feelings over religion. But religion is not a warm, fuzzy thing. You see... <clears throat> There were two trees in the garden. Let's go over some basic stuff. There was the tree of life. The tree that Christ wanted us to eat. Y'all remember that tree? Yeah, well, we forgot it that day. And the tree of good and evil. So religion is the good on this tree. Because all religion can ever do is try to make you feel good. It can't get you life. It just modifies your behavior. And when you modify your behavior, you kind of fake yourself out. You modify your behavior into thinking, well, now that I'm not doing this or I am doing this, I'm good enough for God. I'm also good enough to tell other people how to act too. Can I get a little amen? amen. Okay. So what we know is in Ephesians 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul writing to a church over there where I just was, Asia Minor in the eastern area, he wrote to them and he said, you're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. Understand, you're going to be saved because God's going to pay the price for your bad behavior. Now, because we understand that, if you attend church here, you understand we are not saved by religious activity. Please remember that it doesn't matter if you cut your hair long, cut it short. It doesn't matter if you dye it, nip it, tuck it, stretch it. It doesn't matter. Put extensions on it. Those things won't keep you out of heaven. It doesn't matter if you have no tattoos or a million tattoos. and That may offend you. But understand what you've done is you've written on your dirt suit. The suit you're going to leave when you die anyway. With me? You can pierce it, punch it, uh, recolor it, stretch it out in the middle or shrink it up. You can muscle it up or thin it up. You can do whatever you want to to your dirt suit. Okay, it's the choice in accepting Jesus as the Son of God, which means He was the sacrifice for all your sin. Past, present, future. When you accept Him as the payment to, to remove the division between man and God, then it opens up a life that changes everything. You're not saved by works. Pastor, I remember the day I got saved. I got down and I prayed a sinner's prayer. Okay, well, which one did you pray? Because is the one you prayed the right one and everybody else prayed the wrong one? Where's the one you prayed? Is it written in your Bible? There's not one. 
Because accepting Christ is a belief of the heart. It's not what comes out of your mouth. Because I know people that profess Christ and, and they wouldn't know him if he walked in the room. So sometimes talk is cheap. You with me? So we understand we're saved by grace through faith, through believing that Christ was enough, his sacrifice was enough, which removes my behavior from my salvation. You with me so far? Here's the problem with grace preachers. Here's the problem where I've had some people misinterpret me. Because some people walk away from hearing a message of grace and go, well, if grace is it and I'm saved, and once I'm saved, I'm saved. He said he'd never leave me, he'd never forsake me. My behavior doesn't matter anymore. Sweetheart, you've just bit into a big slice of stupid with whipped cream and cherries on top. Because Romans 6 and 23 was written in the New Covenant. And it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. And you've got to understand your behavior Jesus came that you might have life, that you might be born again, that you might be the sons and daughters of God. But for you to have life more abundantly, your behavior has got to start mirroring Jesus Christ, not the desires of your flesh. Not what you want, but what He wants. Say that. Not what I want, but what He wants. Now the miracle happens is when the two become the miracle happens is when all of a sudden your heart's desires are the same as his. And let me tell you something, that doesn't happen overnight. You're going to go through a period of it's a battle between your flesh and your spirit. And I'm going to try to go over these things today, but I want you to understand that people, people make slanderous comments about grace. They call grace sloppy, and they call grace greasy, and they call grace hyper, even though that is the word in the Greek Paul used to describe it, overabundance of grace that God gives. Grace was bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace is the holiest, most gracious thing that God could ever give to man. Grace is precious. You understand? It's not cheap. But is grace in the term that we somehow hear, is grace kind of greasy? Is grace kind of sloppy? Well, have you ever been kissed by a, a nine or a ten month old baby? Have you? Kind of leaves a mark, doesn't it? It was sloppy, wasn't it? It's kind of greasy, wasn't it? But it was love, wasn't it? It left a mark too, didn't it? When you envision the grace of God, you have to envision a kiss that's not controlled. But a kiss that just covers you all up. A kiss that says, oh my, I love you so much I could eat you. And then he does. He consumes you. You understand? But when you first give your life to Christ, that's when the battle begins. Let me walk you through some scripture to try to help you. Because you've got to understand what I'm saying. Pastor, my behavior is not going to get me kicked out of heaven. No, it's not, sweets. Once you accept Jesus in, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But your bad behavior is going to cause you to live in such hell. And such turmoil on this earth. What kind of witness are you going to be? What kind of example of Jesus are you going to be? For most of us, we love to be the recipients of grace. Can I get an amen? Wouldn't you like to get pulled over by a highway patrolman? And he'd come back to you with your driver's license and go, You know, I've noticed, Mr. Wallace, this is the first ticket you've had in 10 years. You've been so good, you've... You've just done such, you know, we're just going to let this one slide. But are you kidding me? That guy looks at me and goes, Pastor, you ought to know better. Of all people, you shouldn't be speeding. Because the law has but one purpose. To discipline you. And if discipline were the way to be perfect, if being more disciplined was perfection in people's lives, then the military, the most disciplined people on the planet, wouldn't have to have military police. 
Because just telling people what to do does not guarantee they're going to do it. Can somebody say amen? amen? If that was the truth, you'd have to tell your kids to do something and they'd get it right. Oh, let's break it on down. God would only have to tell us to do something. How's that working for you? About like it's working for me? And my wife says, Amen. So let me read you some scriptures that, that we've gone over the last few weeks because we're talking about the rapture of the church, the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're looking at end time events. And in the middle of all of that, there's this 50% that bother me because I don't want to be one of them. Pastor, are you listening to fear? No. I'm doing what Paul told the church in Corinth to do. Examine yourselves to see if you're of the faith say the word faith he did not say examine yourself and see if you're following all the rules because you can't follow all the rules while the ten commandments were being written and God gave them to Moses and he was coming down Mount Sinai with them they'd already broken two of them at the bottom they broke two he got down broke the third you with me? So rules written on stone you can't follow. But a loving God leading you by grace you can. But there's a trick to this. Let, let me show you something. Let me, let me give you the passages that create issues for us first. Let's go to Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see, there's the lip service again. But he that does the will of my Father, the will of the Father which is in heaven, verse 22 says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not, look, look at the works, look at the works now. Have we not prophesied in your name? And have we not in your name cast out devils? And in your name done many wonderful works. In verse 23 he says, and then I will profess unto them. Say it with me. I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work. And what does he call it? Hmm. Let's stay in Matthew a minute and go to 24, verses 40 and 41. Same long conversation Jesus is having. He says, two will be in the field. One taken, the other left. Somebody say 50%. Hmm. Next verse. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One taken. The other left. Somebody say 50%. Next verse. Or is that the last one there? I'm sorry. That's the last one there. Let's go to chapter 25, verses 12 and 13. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Look. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Watch. He's not saying watch others. He's saying stand guard over your own self. You see, what I'm convinced of is because the church is now teaching grace and people like Joseph Prince and, my goodness, even Jimmy Swaggart Ministries and, and there's dozens of men now scouring the countryside and we're seeing a huge revival of grace being taught. People are going, yes! And somehow they think that's permission to go do whatever they want. Let me help you very quickly. The behavior that you've been freed from is the behavior that comes from religion. You've not been freed from the punishments of the behavior that come through being stupid. Do you see the separation? Go to Israel with me next time. Maybe it'll help you start to see. What you've been, what Paul is constantly telling the church from is, look, you're free from feast days. You're free from celebration days. You're free from funny haircuts. You're free from wrapping leather around your head. You're free from all these religious things because they were pointing you to knowing Jesus when he came. That's what you're free from. You're still not free from being stupid. Let 
Would somebody say amen? amen. You're really scaring me right now. Let me see if I can help. Galatians 5.1. Paul would write this and say, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Now, he's saying this to the church in Galatia because Messianic Jews have come in that believe in Christ and believe in the law. And they're trying to get the church in Galatia to start embracing Jewish rituals with their freedom. Sweetheart, did the thief on the cross make it to heaven? Yes or no? It's got to be one or the other. Did he or didn't he? Okay, he made it to heaven. We know that because God, who is Jesus, looked at him and said, This day shall you be with me in paradise. Yes or no? Is that what he said? Okay, so you have to ask yourself, if the thief on the cross is the first convert under a sacrificed Savior who's forgiven all the world for sin, what religious perfunctions did he have to do to make it in? Did he join a church? Did he get baptized in the River Jordan? Did he take communion every week? Did he confess his sins to a priest or a priestess? Did he get a funny haircut? Did he buy a bicycle and pass out Bibles? Did he sell poppies at the airport? All he did was what John would record in chapter 3, verse 16. Believe. That was all he did. He just believed. And he made it home. You with me? So was the bar, was the bar to have life set high or low? Low. Believe. But Jesus said, I didn't come that you just might have life, that you might be born again. He said, I've come that you might have life and then have it more. To have abundant life, something's got to change in your behavior. Because the things you've been doing are the things that are killing you. Let me see if I can help. Lord, help me. He gave me this message this morning. This is simply an outline of an ongoing problem in my mind. Romans 6, 12 through 18. Let me take you there for a minute. Let me take you to the book of Romans chapter 6. Let not, and he's talking to the church. Say, I'm the church. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey the lusts thereof. You with me so far? Now, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but rather yield yourselves to... In Galatians, Paul writes and he says... Be led by the Spirit, not by the flesh, to fulfill its desires. Here's what I firmly believe. I firmly believe that as believers, we get saved, we come into a house of worship, we come into a house of fellowship, and we're not schooled, we're not taught, we're not prompted to learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. No, we're taught to listen to the preacher. And we create another form of idolatry. Amen. All of a sudden, that pastor is your connection to God. Sweetheart, there's only one mediator. And that's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who sits at the right hand of the Father, ever mediating for you and me. Don't elevate the pastor. If you get to know him, you'll be sorely disappointed. Pastor, why is it that people that get real close to you leave the church? Because they find out the whole time I'm just as big a mess up as they are. And somehow in their mind, they thought that the preacher was perfect. Honey, there ain't nothing perfect about me but my looks. <laughs> now you have to understand, there's not a perfect person here. And if you think you are, you are more messed up than, than I am. 
I'm the last one to stand up here and tell you I've got it all together. The Bible says get angry and sin not. Yeah, I don't do very good with that one either. The Bible says a whole lot of things you shouldn't do that I still do. Can you admit that you have the same problem? Or are you that big a liar that you can't admit that? Please understand something. We've got to quit making idols out of men. We've got to learn to be led by the Spirit. You can't be led by the Spirit if you don't spend time in the Spirit book and spend time praying in the Spirit language and get in the presence of the Spirit and hang out with people that are trying. If you hang out with people that are carnal, you're going to learn to listen to the flesh. Have you ever, have you ever done anything the flesh said do? Do you know that voice yet? Because I'll be honest with you, he can disguise himself sometimes to me, and I think it's the Holy Ghost. You know how I know the difference? Because when the flesh speaks, he always wants to please me. Are you hearing me? It's always about making me feel good, making me look good, making me more money. It's always going to benefit me. But Jesus said, no greater gift is any man than he lays down his life for a friend. Give. For God so loved the world, he, he didn't take. He sowed in the process of time he's reaping. And beloved, when you sow in the process of time, you'll reap. Without labor, you'll reap. All over the land of Israel. Look, olives are expensive. Olive oil is expensive. Amen? But all over the land of Israel, God's got olive trees. God gave them olive trees. Who do you think is making all that money off olives? God's children. And they're not even living in the right covenant. That doesn't stop Him from loving them. Even when you're acting like a stupid person, God's still going to bless you and still love you. But don't mistake that with God saying, it's okay for you to keep on doing whatever you're doing. Because it's not. The entanglement of yoke, of bondage, is religious activity. God doesn't want you to think that because you got baptized in water, now you're saved. No, when you accepted forgiveness, you were saved. Anything else you do after that is a reminder that you're saved. It can't save you. Communion can't save you. Only the blood of Jesus can save you. And when you accepted Him, you drank it in and you ate of His flesh. You became one with Him when you got saved. Anything you do after that is a reminder of what He's already done for you. Let's read on a little more. Where was I? Romans 6, 12 I was, and I was reading down. No, I wasn't. Yes, I was. 13, neither yield your members as instruments. Uh, let's go to 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Say it with me. For you are not under the law, but under grace. He's talking to believers that should be living in grace, and they're trying to live by laws again. They're trying to get entangled again back with religious exercises and religious practices. 15, what then, he says, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under the grace? God forbid. Beloved, when you get saved, you need to let your behavior change. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians six twelve, one of my favorite passages to tell people that are hung up in law. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, he says, All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. One translation puts it this way. I'm free to do all things, but not all things are profitable. I'm free right now to act fool any way I want to. I'm still going to heaven. But what's the price going to be here? What's the cost going to be here? And what's my witness going to look like to be here? Just because you're in grace doesn't give you the right to act like an idiot. It doesn't. But yet many people think that when you preach grace, you're giving people a license to act stupid. I didn't have to give you a license to act stupid. We've been doing that all along just as, just as, as good as anybody. Somebody say amen. 
Paul wouldn't have had to write the following things. Look at Romans 14 and 23. Look at this just for a moment. Paul says, And he that doubts is damned if he eats, because he eats not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You talk about a big loophole. You talk about a big stump hole to trip in. What Paul's trying to say is, if you're going to start trying to live by, by, by activity and sin, understand this. Anything you do that you didn't believe in doing, it's now sin for you. For instance, I was taught all my life going to the movies was a sin. Going to the movies is not a sin. But I was taught it was. So the first time I went to a movie, I sat there thinking, oh, I couldn't enjoy the movie. Jesus is coming, and I'm going to get left right here. I went home that night. I walked in the house so condemned, my daddy knew what I had done. He knew, called me out on it, and beat me for it. And I remember going, oh, God, I've, I've, listen, when you believe you're doing something wrong, it brings your self-condemnation. God's not giving it to you. You're condemning yourself. To be weak in the faith, to be weak in the faith is to believe that there comes a bunch of religious activity with me getting saved. Paul would write and say, you're making the cross of Christ of no effect. You can't believe religious activity is going to save you. But you have to believe that because you are saved, your activities are now going to start looking different. Let me see if I can show it to you this way. Let's go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. And let's go to chapter 5. And Kelly, I hope I gave you this, these verses. Galatians chapter 5. Let's go back there a minute, and let's start at verse 16. Verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now hold your finger right there, and go to Colossians chapter 3. Look at this for a second. Colossians 3, 1 through 9. Hold your finger right there in Galatians, because we're coming right back. If you then be risen with Christ, in other words, you've been baptized in Christ, you accepted Him, you believed, and now you have new life. Seek those things which make you rich. No. Seek those things that make you popular. Seek those things that make you famous. Mm -mm. See, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. Hmm. Read with me. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. All the way through verse 9. For if you are dead, for you are dead, not if, but you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now understand, if my life is hidden with Christ in God, then if I go try to live like the world, I'm having to put on the world. It's not who I am. It's something I have put on and I must cast it off. You with me? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall appear with Him in glory. He's telling you you're secure. But then He says this. He's talking to Christians. Mortify, kill your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. Use that word every day, don't you? And covetousness, which is idolatry. And he goes on, look, he goes on to say, For which things sake the wrath of God. This, uh, please understand, you got to have a biblical definition of wrath. The word wrath means, you've been, picture it this way, you're a little kid who's been trying to get to the fireplace because you're enthralled by fire. And God's the daddy standing there with his hand on your head going, it's as close as you're going to get. You're not going to get any closer. Is he protecting you or hurting you? But you're that child. What do you think God's doing? You think God's hurting you. He's keeping you from that fun, orange, crackly, snappy thing. You just, you want to go see what it is. He's going, it's not good for you. This is as close as you need to be. The word wrath means because God has to give you the desires of your. You, 
you haven't been listening, the word wrath means God lifts his hand and lets you have what you wanted. It doesn't mean God's mad with you. God is light in him is no darkness at all. God's anger is not dark. It's light. The wrath of God comes on the children who disobey. Those who won't listen. Verse 7 says, In the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. You used to be there. You used to be there. Why are you trying to act like you still are? Because we're listening to the flesh and not the spirit. But now also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. He goes in verse 9 to say, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Now, beloved, I, I don't know how to make the case any stronger. I don't know how to, to, to sit with you today and say, just because Pastor Tom preaches grace, it doesn't mean you have the right to follow your flesh and flaunt it in people's faces. Show no restraint. The Bible teaches moderation in all things. You do know, of course, that doesn't mean moderation in serial killing. You do understand that, right? Because people always want to take it somewhere else, don't they? You see, it, the Bible is telling me to be a, a minister of reconciliation, to be an example of Christ everywhere I go, not in judgment, but in, in love. I don't have the right in grace to act any way that hurts you. And that's probably one of the most difficult places to walk because I'm the pastor and I offend more people than all of you. Why? Because I'm the one standing up here talking. And I'll say things that you don't like or things that you think. I had one guy come to me after a service and go, I don't appreciate you talking about me. I said, dude, I don't even know you. I'm not talking about you. I'm just being led by the Spirit. Maybe the Holy Ghost was talking to you. You just didn't want to hear what he had to say. You understand, as a believer, it is my daily job. To, to look in the mirror and go, whoa, am I being full of grace? I've received much. I need to give much. You know, I've been given much love. Am I giving much love? God, you've blessed me financially. Am I giving blessings financially? Lord, you've, you've forgiven me of a lot of bad stuff. Am I not forgiving other people? Or am I holding on to unforgiveness for my ex? Or my stepkids? Or my original kids? Am I mad at God? As they give me some music to kind of land this, and next week we're going into signs of the times in the New Testament, and I've got some beautiful stuff to share with you from Israel next week. Thank you for joining us today at Journey Church. Join us on our journey. Contact us on the web at www. Dot journeychurchmb.com For Pastor Tom Wallace and all the congregation at Journey Church, may God richly bless you today.